uh, spending your final hours of working before the long weekend. Uh, we've got an exciting regulatory webinar. As I said in my post earlier, I promise that to thank. Um, we'll be talking today about running a freelance or virtual law firm in 2020 uh, with uh, the SRA. We've got some fantastic speakers uh, lined up. We've got uh, Emma Tanley, who is policy manager at the Solicitors Regulatory Authority. We've got uh, Janet Farrell, uh, loyal policy associate. Um, I'm going to call him Jay uh, because he's allowed me to. Thank you very much, Jay, for that. Uh, and we've got Guy Stern, uh, CEO and founder of Legal Connection. Uh, later uh, this afternoon, we're also going to be having uh, Jeff Dunnett, uh, who is the Professional Services Director at ShieldPay, uh, joining us in about half an hour for his uh, part of the session. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I will uh, start uh, with a question uh, directly to, to you, Jay. Uh, could you please uh, explain to us briefly what is the concept of a uh, legal freelancer? Um, Tim, I thank you. Yeah, so a freelancer basically is someone that, that we regard as practicing on their own. So the way the regulations are written in the, the SRA standards and regulations is that it's a, a solicitor just practicing on their own. So we, it's someone that's um, not employed, doesn't have employees. Um, they're mobile in terms of how they work and how they operate, who they're working with. Um, and in terms of how they engage with their clients, it's exactly the same, that they're just, you know, it's a freelance model. You're not engaging with a law firm and there's no structure around you in the sense that you haven't got back office staff or you haven't got um, other partners that you're working with. So you are purely just working on your own. So in terms of a freelance system, that's what, we've, that's what we see a freelancer as, that it's someone working and practicing on their own. It's a, it's a newly introduced um, kind of regulation in place. Uh, overall, could you tell us uh, whether those freelancers are subject to the same regulations as uh, the conventional kind of law practice that we've got? Yeah, this is interesting, this is, because this is where we did get some feedback or where there's been a little bit of, um, should we say, um, a few grey areas where people haven't understood the freelancer model. So through the standards and regulations, when we launched on the 25th of November, what we had was a whole suite of regulations coming through. So there was the SRA principles, the SRA code of conduct for solicitors, the code of conduct for firms, the authorization rules um, and our enforcement strategy and the disciplinary rules. So for solicitors that are working as freelancers, it's really important to note that they're still subject to firstly the SRA principles. So they're bound by the duty. These are ethical principles as well. So it's duty to act in the client's best interests, um, to act with integrity, to act with honesty. Um, so they're ethical behaviors that apply regardless of how the solicitors practice or whatever badge they've given themselves. Um, secondly, the Solicitor's Code of Conduct for individual solicitors, European lawyers or, or foreign lawyers, again, it's important to, to understand that this code of conduct, again, will apply to freelancers, as does it to a partner working in a global city firm, or whether it's a recognised sole practitioner, or whether it's a partner in a traditional partnership setup. It doesn't matter where the solicitor's working, how they're working. So this code of conduct sets out standards. So not the ethical behaviours, but the standards that we expect of someone practising as a solicitor. So we'll have things like, you know, that they need to comply with undertakings, how they service their clients, give them the best possible information, um, duties to maintain um, and protect client confidentiality, not act where there's a conflict. So all of those sort of standards that apply to a solicitor, regardless of where they work, will apply to a freelance solicitor as well. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, one, one question to you, Emma. I know that uh, the, the regulation has been in place since November 2019. How many people have registered under, under that group? And have you seen kind of spike at the beginning and then a slowdown or, or has it been kind of consistent uh, registrations under under freelance solicitor uh, group? Yeah, hi. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I think um, the, the stats are evolving every day, obviously. I think we've got over, over 100 registered freelancers now, um, but that will include those that, that are doing reserved work as well as un, un, uh, unreserved as well as reserved work. Um, I think we, we did have a flurry at the beginning. Um, it's uh, stable, stay a bit stable at the moment, but obviously we're in we're in, a, we're in a particularly difficult environment at the moment. So 
um, whilst registrations may, may have tailed off more recently, mm. I suspect that there's bigger forces at play um, uh, uh, around that. Thank you. Uh, Guy, I've got a question for you. I, I know that uh, while designing a legal connection, you've had that very particular group in mind. Uh, could you tell us um, how did you spot that emerging trend? Uh, why is it important to you to focus on this very small subset? Is it going to remain small? Do you envision that there will be there will be more people practicing uh, under that group? Sure. Uh, thanks, Tima. Thanks for having me as well. Um, so yeah, we're Legal Connection. We're a startup, and um, often when you're in the startup ecosystem, you are looking to find something that's uh, starting out and growing, a trend that's uh, just taking off. So last year, when we heard that in November 2019 there was going to be a big regulation change. Uh, within the legal sector, obviously, we looked at our own product and saw how can we um, how can we sort of gear our product to to make the optimal use out of this out of this regulation uh, moment. Um, our product, you'll see it in a bit. It, it is a tool for remote working and for for lawyers that work by themselves for themselves. I used to call them coffee shop lawyers, but now you know <laughs> that's obviously quite evolved, and now we're all in some ways working uh, working remotely. Um, but but yeah. The, I, I, I knew about this SRA regulation. I then uh, tried my best to get in touch with the SRA. I met Emma <laughs> at, um, at an event at Hogan Levels, and I sort of brought my phone up to her and showed it to her. Look, this is the, the app that we're building around the, um, the, the freelance solicitors. Or she told me the word freelance solicitors. We were calling them solos. And yeah, it, it, um, it began a conversation, obviously, which, uh, which you know now, a few months later, leads up to this webinar. Thank you, Guy. I just think that I've got a question to you. Um, we know that uh, often the, the legal community overall could, could be quite stubborn uh, when, when novelties are being introduced. Uh, could you tell us like, what has been the reaction of the, of the wider uh, uh, community under the SRA? Yeah, sure. I think when we first put the proposal out to consult, it was that, you know, people have that immediate knee-jerk reaction to say, you know, what's this that, you know, the sort of in the headlines it was that you know we're dilute, diluting the profession so that we were going to create another brand of solicitor um but when you once you start speaking to people um and going through the concept in terms of how they work and like as we mentioned previously now that the the protect the, the regulatory standards that apply to these freelance solicitors people start understanding the concept a little bit more and yeah if you were using guy's term every day in in sort of the, the news, you know, these are coffee shop lawyers, you'd probably think, okay, where are they leaving their stuff? You know, yeah. is, is there a worry that they'll leave their briefcase behind or, or their laptop switched on whilst they're getting their next flat white? Um, but no, once you start talking about how the model's going to actually, you know, what it's there to do and who it's there to serve, people have started to come around. So that resistance that we had at the probably the early stages when we were out to consult and some of the formal responses as well that we had to consultation, which said that this was completely the wrong thing to be doing once you start speaking to people Timo and getting them to understand okay this is what the freelancer model does and Emma picked up on a really important point as well which is that there's technically two types of freelancers one that's doing the unreserved work and those that are doing reserved work and if you think about it those that are doing the unreserved work they probably fall into camps such as will writing um, GDPR data protection advice that sort of stuff and those sort of models or those sort of teams or businesses those coffee shop lawyers have been out there for ages um, because but they're calling themselves as will writers or legal consultants whereas now they'll be able to call themselves a solicitor the other side, which is the reserve legal activities, that's where we've set out some really key restrictions as well. So when we were talking about the standards or the regulations that apply, when you're doing reserved work, there is still an element of protection that we think that needs to be in place. So we've introduced some conditions to make sure that it's quite clear that these are freelance solicitors. And as I mentioned, that, you know, no employees or they can't be employed. They can't practice out of a service company. So you can't be Jatinda Loyal Limited. It just has to be Jatinda Loyal as the individual. Mm. Um, they're not allowed to hold any client money, so transactional money. So that's a really important point as well as part of how solicitors or lawyers normally practice that they tend to be used to be holding clients of money, you know sums of money for clients um, and the other point that we introduced was that they these individuals must have adequate and appropriate insurance so we're not prescribing the level of insurance that they have to have for doing the reserved work and then any other work that they do but they need to have insurance in place 
Uh, pl yeah. pl please hold, hold that thought because I have some money questions later on. Maybe over to you, Emma. No, I was just going to add to that. I think uh, initially people just perceive there to be a, a reduction in consumer pr protections mm. associated with this type of uh, practice. Um, and the more and more people get to understand actually that there are risk mitigants in, in, the, in the way that we've gone about this, uh, the more people are accepting or even embracing of the, of the opportunities that, 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 that our flexibilities allow. It's a question of understanding, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just, just one, one quick note. I just put forward the first poll to our audience. Uh, the question to you guys today is, what are your thoughts on going solo? Uh, there are four possible answers. I'm going to keep that up for the next 120 seconds, and then I'm going to move to the next one. So please be swift. Um, so I've got actually a follow-up question uh, on that uh, to you, uh, Emma. Uh, can, you, can you tell us? Um, essentially how important innovation is to driving that change. The change in um, freelance in, model. Correct. Yeah. Well, I think from, from first principles, um, the review of our handbook was, was, was partly driven by a desire to have rules that allowed for innovation. So it's quite fundamental in, in the sense that we tried, well, we try, we have remo removed prescription from our rules. That means that uh, the way that solicitors or firms uh, achieve compliance, it, we're agnostic, for example, to tech uh, is, you know, and it, it, if it allows people to do things in different ways and people to practice in different ways. So yes, uh, you know, innovation was at the heart of, of our, you know, it, the, the desire to achieve innovation was at the heart of, of our review of the of the handbook, as well as obviously making sure we had the right standards um, in place that that solicitors must 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 meet. Thank you, thank you, Emma. Uh, and that leads me to a question to to you, Guy. Um, I mean, how do you, as a new as the innovator, uh, view the regulations and uh, what has been your impression and your experience with uh, uh, dealing with the SRA itself? Yeah, look, I, I think we, we got lucky. As Emma says, you know, the, the tech is sometimes a bit of an enabler to new business models and regulators, you know, they, they need to react to, to trends that are forming. So if you look at sort of the Uber, you know, the gig economy as it happened, in many ways, sometimes tech runs away with something and then the regulators catch up. Obviously, with the legal profession, things are planned out um, and, and thought through a little bit more. It's a heavily regulated industry. So, yeah, so we, we just happen to be, I guess, in the right place at the right time because I'd been building a product that helps a lawyer run their practice from their phone, run their practice from their laptop, connect to other lawyers within their professional networks in, in a way that speaks to the, the LinkedIn um, sort of network effects. Um, and so when we saw the, the regulation and we, when we started to understand it, we started to realize, um, you know, that it's the, the product that we were building and, and the, the regulations that were coming into effect kind of had a, a you know, a, a lot of um, interesting um, parallels. And I think uh, when, I, when I first showed you the app, Emma, I said to you, look, we built this app around the freelancer model. <laughs> and you said to me, wow, how did you know? Because I said, <laughs> Um, but so obviously that uh, we did, I didn't know about the SRA regulations when I started working on the app. But um, yeah, we, we definitely I definitely was looking at the principles that apply within other verticals within the gig economy. Um, the way that you know I saw the industry moving. So I've got my uh, second question to the audience. Uh, if you're thinking of becoming a freelance solicitor, does the SRA guidance on freelance solicitors give you enough to help uh, to make that decision? So uh, again, you guys will have two minutes, and uh, I have another question uh, to you, Emma, in the meantime. Um, essentially, users of legal services want instant access to information overall. So are Apple Android apps the way forward? Are those you know, being recommended? Are, are we still kind of shying away and, and, and keeping up to the traditional way of, of uh, servicing people? Yeah, I mean, um, I think if you, the, 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 what's happening now in this, in this really difficult time is, is showing how tra traditionally, I think, uh, legal services consumers have shied a bit, a bit away from, from tech because they're so used to this face to face contact and 
with that in some way the concept that, that, that of trust in in, in the face to face contact. Um, but I think we are and we will be seeing more of a shift um, towards consumers uh, and, and, and law firms being more accepting of, of virtual and online um, ways of interacting with lawyers, not only because they're being forced to do that in the, in the current environment, um, but also because we as a regulator are taking much more confident steps, I suppose, in terms mm. of our Role, our role and position on, on tech um, and how it can support access to justice. So, um, you know, we, we've been running a, a challenge process um, with some funding that we secured through the Regulators Pioneer Funding Fund. And that's enabling us to, to speak confidently about the challenges and opportunities of tech uh, and, you know, develop the role that we, we see ourselves play, playing there in terms of guidance and support for consumers. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Um, I, I've got a difficult question for you, Jatinder. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> can, you, can you confirm for us that uh, Solicitor can provide legal ser services through an unauthorized uh, entity? Um, so, Tima, yeah, this is the point that I was mentioning before, that what we have is um, the concept of reserved and unreserved legal activities. Mm -hmm. So what you have is that the unreserved legal activities are those that we mentioned, things like will writing, data protection advice, mm -hmm. um, you know, employment stroke, HR advice, so mm -hmm. that sort of thing in-house. Um, there's there's a whole raft of, you know, whether you're looking at things like welfare, social, social security sort of benefits, that sort of advice, that all of those can be done outside of an authorised firm and they are already being provided by, should we say, lawyers using that title um, through different businesses or different setups. So what you have is that the, the regulations, the way they moved was that, yeah, these solicitors now, if they want to practice in the unreserved space, they can call themselves a solicitor. Prior to that, they were calling themselves non-practicing or, like I said, legal consultants or giving themselves some other title. Um, in terms of the reserved work, that's where you have um, the limitations and conditions. So as we've always seen traditionally, that a solicitor has to practice either as a recognized sole practitioner or within an authorized firm so they can carry on reserved work. And for freelancers, like I said, there are certain conditions that they have to 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 abide by in order to carry on that work. And and Emma, Emma sort of mentioned it as well. It's in terms of sort of mitigating the risks around sort of consumer protection, and there's certain things that are there. Uh, the controls around, or should we say, the prohibition that they can't hold or receive any client money. Um, you know that when you think about it, law firms traditionally receive and hold loads of client money. If you're a conveyancing firm, you've got mm. you know potentially millions or thousands of pounds passing through the firm every week. Um, the same if you're a personal injury firm. But it's not to say that these lawyers can't do that. You know that work. It's not to say that a freelancer can't do conveyancing. It's not to say that a freelancer can't do personal injury work. It just means that there are certain conditions, and they'll need to think about workarounds as well, and workarounds that are compliant. So technology will provide a solution to a point um, because it's about thinking about okay if I haven't got that face-to-face -face interaction with my client or I haven't got an office space anymore how can I still do due diligence through technology that sort of stuff what does the app allow me to do if I'm thinking about drafting something for my client whether it's a you know a trust document or something you know can I do that through through an app so that it's released confidentially to the you know mm -hmm. to the to the client so the concept of the work that they do there is there is the key distinction in terms of what different freelancers can do but there's nothing stopping now a solicitor from providing unreserved legal services outside of a regulated firm thank and you calling, thank and you. calling themselves thank you for that. just 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 to make it clear for our audience because there are quite a few questions floating here limited companies out of the question is yeah. So if you're, yeah, this is this is again important to understand. If you're doing the unreserved work, so if you were doing will writing or you know data protection, let's just keep that as our common examples. Mm. I I could set up as Jatinder Loyal Limited if I wanted mm. to, because we're not we're not restricting how the freelancer operates in that space. But if I was Jatinder Loyal thinking of doing um, litigation, so I wanted to stand up in court and exercise my rights of audience, I would have to do that just as Jatinder Loyal. I couldn't do it through a service company or, or, or a, should we say, incorporated practice as a limited or LLP. It just have to be just Jatinder Loyal as a solicitor. I get it. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just publishing the next uh, question, uh, which is, if you're thinking of working as a freelancer solicitor, 
We will consider using a third party managed accounts. I'm just putting that forward to our audience and I'm coming back to you, Emma, because I heard you mentioning the legal access challenge. What's that about? Okay, so um, probably about two years ago, um, building on our existing innovation work, um, we decided we would want to put more of a focus on tech innovation and, and particularly to get ourselves in a position where we, we, we could understand the risks and challenges and, and opportunities of, of tech to change, uh, change the legal services marketplace. Um, so we took the opportunity of uh, partnering with Nesta Challenges to, uh, well, we bid for the money, but we part partnered with Nesta from a reg the Regulators Pioneer Fund and ran the Legal Access Challenge, which had the objective, A, of uh, accelerating, um, te you know, accelerating solutions to the access justice issue, tech solutions, um, through a package of financial and other support, but also critically, and I think we've already touched on on this, is was for us to build these networks with mm. with, with real innovators to actually get under the bonnet of what these challenges are, how, how we potentially need to adapt our regulatory approach, whether there were pinch points with our regulation, how we could engage with innovators, how we get, you know, how we get inside their heads um, and to sort of build a lasting community uh, that we could, you know, interact with just as we are now in, in the sense of developing what we need to do as a regulator going forward. So we, we had a huge, huge, hugely um, we had 117 applicants, eight finalists. Uh, we ran events with with, with uh, applicants that didn't actually make make the fi final um, competition. Yeah, we, we were one of the people. Yeah, who applied, I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but we've learned a huge amount. We've learned a huge amount about technology. We've, we've learned a huge huge amount about the um, innovate ecosystem, and it, it's. It's uh, in, it's informed a massive amount of our thinking about our future strategy, which has tech and innovation at its at its core. And, and go is, on and on. Is that is that the, is that is that the only way you're supporting innovation? I do you have any guidance uh, or resources for developers okay, that, they, that can be active. So uh, up to, up to now, our focus on um, innovation has been supporting our regulated community, mm -hmm. obviously, to innovate through a range of different means, uh, waivers to our rules, one-to-one um, mm -hmm. -one guidance. Um, through through the legal access challenge, obviously, we've been thinking about how protect. We've we found issues that the broader in, 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 innovator community faces in terms of understanding our regulations. So going forward, we're thinking about how we can adapt our approach in terms of guidance that A, both helps our regulated firms, but potentially is a, a, um, a resource that's available for, for innovators. And um, we've got all sorts of ideas um, in, our, in our business plan about how we develop our guidance and resource package going forward. Um, so kind of watch this space. That's coming out shortly. Good, good to hear. Good to hear, Emma. Uh, Guy, I've got a question to you. Uh, I mean, often people would uh, likely consider freelancers as uh, people that work on their own, uh, almost like lonely wolves. So what, what is your perception on that? And can use uh, can tech be used uh, to allow people to work together but still be freelancers? Yeah, that's a nice question, and it's often uh, something that that I hear. You know, the it, the the people get scared to go freelance. They like the uh, community of being in a law firm and working with other people, um, and certainly it's something that we address in our own product and in in our design. The, we create this Slack-like environment where people can, uh, where various solicitors can get together in small groups and quite quickly create virtual law firms. Um, and then, you know, with the help of Shield Pay, uh, the ability for them to create third-party managed accounts almost on the fly, um, and to sort of recreate a lot of the professional networks that, that existed. Um, I was inspired in a way 
by a lot of the sort of freelance lawyers that I that I worked with right at the beginning, and they were and I started to understand the way they sent work to one another, the way they um, grouped together. You know, five people who went to law school and knew each other their whole careers would very often pass the same cases with uh, within the same circles, and so that's something that we we obviously addressed a lot in our product. Um, I know that there's there's um, Ian Locke, for example, is uh, is creating his own sub network of. Um, of freelance solicitors, and then he's going to, you know, be working with these solicitors to create a community to get them, uh, you know, deal prices on things like insurance. And I'm sure that there are a lot more people that are going to be doing um, similar things. And that's something that we we really think a lot about um, as we're building. We're building a very social product. Uh, yeah, you'll see it in a moment, and you've seen it before. Um, but for sure, uh, we we like the idea of bringing people together, lawyers helping lawyers um, in a way that that maybe thinks a little outside of the, the traditional law firm model. Thank you, Guy. Thank you for that. Um, to you, to, to you guys from the SRA, obviously we're putting a, a, in kind of a transition period that is accelerating um, digitization within, uh, within the legal marketplace. You know, what, what do you feel uh, the post-pandemic world looks like uh, when it comes to law? to the business of law. What are your predictions for the near future? I know it's a relatively broad question. I, I don't know who <laughs> wants to take it first. <laughs> I'll kick off. I mean, um, I think we're in unprecedented times at the moment. I think I've said that before. Um, we are keeping a, a real close eye on uh, what's, what's, what's happening out there in terms of the impact of, of COVID on, on law firms. Um, there's been all sorts of predictions about how this might accelerate, you know, technology, digital, I can't say that, digitalization going forward. Um, we're already seeing that in some respect um, because law firms have been forced to work remotely. We've issued um, guidance to help them with that. Um, and I think that might be one of the resources that you're, you're sharing. Mm. Um, I just I think it's too early to say obviously what will happen post COVID nineteen. We 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 expect that there'll be some some firms that will will be struggling and we'll expect to see potentially mergers and unfortunately some firms needing to close. Um, but on the on the positive side, we we've, we've reformed the handbook. We have the flexible arrangements in place. Uh, obviously, we didn't foresee COVID, but you know, the way that we thought about things has, has created an environment where hopefully those potentially those small firms or individuals in those small firms can, th can think about how they might practice differently, um, adopting new ways of working uh, that, they're, that, that they're sort of, you know, learning learning as we speak so we think we have the foundations there that that will create opportunities um as as well as accepting there's going to be risks risks created by the current environment chair yeah, do, do you have anything to add to to to, to go hand hand in hand uh just in there uh could you uh, could you could you tell us what, how how do you see the the near future uh when, when it comes to the development of the legal profession just just before that there are two uh, resources that we're sharing with you guys. One is the SRA of, uh, uh, offer guidance uh, for the freelancers. You can access that on top of the chat. And then there's another resource on third party managed accounts. Those will be available throughout the discussion today. So make sure you, you make use of them. Uh, over to you, Jatinder. Um, I think it's going to be interesting, as Emma said, that, you know, that when something happens, um, people always react very differently. And if you think about when we had the financial crisis, how did the, the sort of, you know, how did the banks, how did the, the lending institutes change how they're doing things that, you know, did they start thinking about things in a different way? Did they start engaging with their customers in a different way? And I think it's going to be the same for lawyers as well now, that they're really going to start having to think about, OK, if I can't access um, should we say, a room to physically see my client, how do I use digital platforms now to start engaging mm. with my client as well? So it's going to be not just freelancers. I think it's going to be every, every should we say, setup, um, legal setup that's there. And I think that it's about, 
yeah, understanding the different risks and how you mitigate those risks. But there's always opportunity. And this is where that people really need to think about, OK, who can I connect with that will help me develop, whether it's a product, whether it's my services as a freelancer. And not just that, it's going to be interesting. I think one thing that will be interesting is that back in 2011, we mm -hmm. became that we became a licensing authority for alternative business structures. So you could have a law firm that was owned and managed by non-lawyers. Um, you know, they, you could have 100% non-lawyer ownership through these structures, or you could be set up with an accountant, with um, an insurance broker, with, with other people that are sort of providing services. Um, and what we saw was that people saw that, yeah, there was opportunity, and it's going to be the same here, but not just with the opportunity. As soon as people started changing their business structure, the traditional law firms that they were working with, they've got to try and keep up as well. So it, you've got to keep up with, you know, the person next door. So if you've got now people taking advantage of what this lockdown brings in terms of how they're working very differently. So they might be using the platforms that guys are going to develop and launch that, you know, the people next door are going to be thinking, OK, why is Jatinda two steps ahead of Timo and, you know, Emma on this? Is it because he's using the platforms that guys provided? Um, mm. And then there'll be people that will take up that opportunity to start thinking, and that's where we'll see more and more products come through. Fantastic. Uh, on, on that, actually, uh, Guy, could you quickly show us actually how, how a platform as such could work? How does the remote practice management really work? Oh. Hello. Mm. Sorry, can you, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I've just shared my screen and Timo, you've seen this before, obviously. This is a legal connection. Um, we sometimes refer to it as the, the Slack of law or the WhatsApp of law. It's a communication and collaboration platform that, that really focuses around uh, the conversation and, and putting the customer in the, in the center of the experience. Um, yeah, and so the, this product is a product that I came up with a couple of years ago um, after, you know, having my own frustrations with the legal profession and uh, wanting to, to feel like I was more involved in the case, wanting to sort of see what my lawyers were working on from a client perspective. Um, and then so and then sort of uh, I iterated and looked at, uh, you know, the needs of the lawyers and the needs of the, the whole ecosystem. Uh, you can see that there's two main components. You've got your matters and you've got your contacts. Uh, your contacts are sort of separated into the different uh, groups that you're working in. So we look at a lawyer who's potentially uh, or a solicitor who's working with, uh, you know, more than one network. Uh, these guys can't necessarily see these cases. These guys can't necessarily see these cases. So will, will, will my client see, see my conversations with, uh, with my other freelance colleagues? Uh, yeah, well, that, that's exactly that. so. We, we, we do privilege on a case by case basis. So if your face is here, then you can see the case. If your face is not there, you can't see the case. So, you know, this client, for example, um, you know, is is involved in this fraud matter and the only lawyers who have access to the files, um, activities and so on are the ones that were invited by, by the lawyer. And, you know, just to add a little extra security, we have this idea that you can remove uh, someone from the matter if, they, if they're no longer needed in the matter. And, you know, in that way, it becomes a lot more secure than something like WhatsApp, Gmail, uh, Dropbox, you know, where, where you often are storing files which uh, are no longer relevant to you. I see. Uh, but again, when, when it comes to security, that's the first question that usually technologists are being tackled uh, For sure. by in lawyers. So, like, I mean, how secure is it? Yeah, well, look, uh, we, we use the, you know, top of the line um, security platform. We use Amazon Web Services. We're plugging into the Microsoft Azure system because a lot of the bigger firms need it. Um, when you look at, again, you know, this picture speaks a lot because we're no longer living in, in, a, in a world where one lawyer is under one particular law firm. A lawyer works within a network and within an ecosystem. Um, and so the security that you need to put in place needs to speak to that. Um, and so, you know, just from from the you know sort of bare essentials, we we created a system in which you can be part of one or more law firms, um, and so and yet you can still have all the you know everything that you need from cloud security in terms of ensuring that your cases are, are safe and secure, and only the people who need access to a particular case have access to that case. And, and we're, we're actually running uh, simultaneously a poll question, which is, would you consider using mobile apps and other tech solutions to help connect with customers? 
we've got 92% uh, of our audience answering yes, and only seven answering as no. Oh, that that's good. Is that is that is, is that uh, is is that app that you've developed, you guys? Is that a mobile uh, only, or 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 is it um, desktop only? How does it work? Yeah, look, it's it's. I can't show it to you right the second, but it um, when you open it on your phone, it looks very much like uh, WhatsApp. So you know, you 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 see this screen with all your chats. You open up one of them, and then you see the faces at the top, and and it looks more or less the same. We definitely were. You know, we did have the mobile first lawyer in mind when we created it. I think that there are a lot of solicitors who look at an interface like this and, uh, you know, they recoil and they think, oh, I don't know if I want something like this. I don't know if I want, you know, the the instant messaging uh, sort of experience. I'm, you know, more familiar with uh, writing a nice email, uh, you know, clicking send um, and, and sort of uh, splitting up my time um, in that way. But again, this this is um, not necessarily just about what the lawyer wants, but also speaks to the trend uh, in terms of um, client-centered design and in terms of um, you know the future of work. Um, and I think it's something that uh, for a client, you know, for, for law firms as well, we hear a lot that um, every law firm has banned WhatsApp, um, but we hear at the same time that most lawyers are still using WhatsApp and connecting with other lawyers at other firms and with the client because the clients demand it. So we try to create a product that speaks to that WhatsAppy um, sort of user experience, but then obviously has the security in place um, and the and, functionality in place. That's and, needed for and we just uh, and we just had uh, Jeff uh, Dunnett, uh, professional service director at ShieldPay, joining our discussion. Now I understand that you're working on an integration with ShieldPay. Can you tell us a bit more about that, which will then lead us to our third part of the discussion today? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, we've got a, um, without ShieldPay, we've got a system over here uh, where, you know, the lawyer can obviously track the money that came into the client account and then the money that went out into the office account. So a thousand pounds came in and so on. And one of the things I noticed uh, as I was building this was, and, and my CTO also looked at this and said, well, why, why is it that you have to go to your internet banking and look at a transaction and then copy the transaction in? And then, you know, there, there was a sort of a manual step that was missing. Why, why can't a client pay and immediately see the money appear here? And when the lawyer takes it out, immediately see it, you know, go down into the office account. Um, and so obviously, and that was sort of on our wish list of features that we wanted to include. So when we met uh, with the Shield Pay team, um, they were, you know, they'd already built that in, in many respects. They'd already built a trust accounting system, which was designed for lawyers that, and they'd worked with the SRA on, on designing um, that third-party managed account system. So, yeah, it's it's been a few a few months, and currently um, we're sort of, as you can see, almost finished with the integration. Uh, right now, what you're able to do in Legal Connection already today is to go uh, to your group, uh, you're able to set up a, um, a third-party managed account. So in this particular instance, maybe I'm with my property lawyer group, um, you know, and maybe we as a group have decided that we want to set up an account. We don't need to go to a bank. Uh, we can go to Shield Pay. We can set up an account for our group. And then in that group, we're able to hold client money legally, you know, in accordance with, with, the, with the rules and regulations. We're, uh, we're also able to um, take payment, uh, do KYC checks, all using the, the technology that ShieldPay spent the last few years working on. Um, and it's, it's really for, for the clients that we're working with and for the lawyers that we're, we're currently looking at uh, working with, um, you know, it's, it's a big game changer for them um, in terms of take, taking that practice and making it really virtual in both the practice management respect, but then also in the financial respect, which is a huge part of it. Um, Thank you, Guy. And I think that uh, with that, I'll, I'll hand it back over. I'll hand over to Jeff. Thank you very much, Jeff. Welcome to our conversation. So um, we've, been, we've been talking a lot about you in your absence. And <laughs> ShieldPay, can, uh, can you tell us a bit more uh, what ShieldPay is? Sure. So um, ShieldPay is um, a third party, well, uh, at its inception, a digital escrow provider. And pay, secure payments company but we've um since 2017 2018 when we met with the sra in the early early stages of their development of the third party managed account principles and the draft rules uh, we met with them at that stage and started exploring whether or not um we could adapt our technology or what we were de developing at the time to suit those needs and at least um take into account 
the expected outcomes that the SRA had in um, in a solution that we were to provide to the legal market. My background is as a lawyer, so I was uh, familiar with the uh, the pains of um, of dealing with client accounts um, or, or or the process of funds, um, and um, and yeah, and so out of that was born our, our third panic managed account solution. We uh, got an Innovate UK grant funding, which was um, which was great. The day in two thousand eighteen, we then. Um, developed particularly around the use case of property transactions, which is where I think you know the biggest pain around holding funds is or the biggest risk is. Um, and really we've gone from there. So we, we're now at about 70 plus law firms, um, bearing in mind that the rule changes only came in in November. Um, we've, you know, we're, we're feeling feeling pretty good that, pe- that there's a, a larger adoption of, of this as a process. But in its core, ShieldPay basically provides KYC and AML services, onboarding all the payers and payees in a transaction and um, facilitates and holds the funds in segregated, safeguarded client accounts uh, with a tier one bank. And in this case, either Barclays or Santander, uh, Santander Lloyds or ClearBank. We have accounts with all of them. Um, and there um, we prefer to reconcile and provide messaging to all parties in a transaction. So you as your client, you will ask them for fees on account or the deposit um, the moment they go through an onboarding process with ShieldPay, pay either by card, um, bank transfer, or in due course open banking. And then um, uh, once we receive the funds, we provide notifications to everyone that everything's happened. Um, and then through digital authorizations, funds are then released um, in accordance with um, overarching documentation or the conditions of the deal. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, Jay, Emma, can you? Tell us a bit more about the relationship with which you pay, how things have progressed from your side. We heard a bit from Jeff uh, here. Um, uh, you know, can you can you tell us a bit more uh, how things progressed over the years? Um, <clears throat> yeah. Hello, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, maybe it's it's been really good in the sense that. Um, not just with Jeff. So yeah, I've I've got a lot of time for Jeff in this in the sense that Jeff will come to us and say, Jatinda, I'm not sure about X, Y, and Z. And this conversation didn't start on the 25th of November last year. This conversation started many many years before that. Mm. Um, and it was because there was this concept, and some people seem to forget that it wasn't us that started the the, the conversations about law firms and their ability to hold client money. Um, or solicitors or lawyers holding client money. This started off by some research that was done by the Legal Services Board. Um, When you look at sort of the risks associated with um, lawyers holding client money, some people say, oh, it's an intrinsic part to to how I practice. It gives clients the confidence that, you know, that I'm doing everything that I need to do for them. And that's all fine. But then you have the cynic in in me that says, okay, if if that's all good, then there wouldn't be the need for something like the SRA's compensation fund that pays out millions of pounds for um, money that has been lost due to the the acts of dishonest solicitors or people working within within law firms. And it's it's really hard to sort of say that, you know, to say that because sometimes then you get, you know, shouted at and people say that, you know, you're tarnishing every solicitor with the same brush. But it's those stories that, should we say, make the Daily Mail that, you know, that, yeah, Chitinda Law ran off with, you know, all the pro- all probate money. So it's those sort of stories that get picked up. And it was on the back of that the Legal Services Board did some research to think about, okay, do solicitors and lawyers generally in, in England and Wales need to be holding client money themselves in their, within their practice? Um, and, and they came up with alternatives and they were looking at other jurisdictions as well. So they looked at Germany, France, you know, some other, you know, the states, some of the um, the different state bars in the USA, they they have alternative arrangements as well. So it was on the back of that that we had the approach from from ShieldPay to say, okay, this is a product that we're looking to develop. What do you think that we need to be doing in terms of making sure that clients understand that this isn't a client account as is traditionally sought, but how do we make sure that there's proper protection around the product that we're developing? Um, so we, we issued guidance back in December 2017 to say that, yeah, if you were thinking about using a TPMA as a law firm, um, the certain things that we want you to think about. So it was making sure that the client understood the, the basis of which 
um, the agreement that you'd entered into with a TPMA provider, um, how the how the transactions would be facilitated, um, but more importantly, that you know, making sure that people understood that the TPMA provider themselves were regulated as well. So this right. was something really important to us. We work very closely with the the Financial Conduct Authority to look at okay, who do we want to have as TPMA providers? And they said okay, from their rules. Um, when you look at the the regulation that applies around money remittance and authorized payments, it has to be you know either a authorized payment institute or those that are exempt for whatever reason. So that's when Jeff came up and said, look, you know we are authorized by the FCA. This is what we've got in terms of our risk, and this is how we manage it. We're compliant, and we do everything that we need to do. And this is the model that we're thinking of developing. And um, some of the early discussions and. Jeff will sort of support me here as well, was trying to get people to understand that the TPA model was slightly different to traditional escrow accounts that law firms were used to be working with. That, you know, they think that, oh, okay, it's an escrow account, you know, that's fine. And then there was the sort of worry around, okay, what does it actually mean? The TPMA solution is slightly different to escrow facilities because what it does, which is the most important thing for me, I think, it provides the consumer or the client with clarity in terms of how the money is being moved from A to B. And during that process, I will be notified by Jeff as the TPMA provider to say, yeah, Jatinda, um, guys thinking about moving £300,000, can you, you know, this is coming up now as, as a notification in the next three days. I have the right to rebut that that movement of money. So as a client, I've got control. And this is really important that sometimes you don't see that control in law firms. Um, because it's all done behind the scenes. So I'm not actually given a, a notification when my solicitor in a traditional law firm would be thinking about moving money. You know, sometimes it's after the event, they'll send me a message to, oh, yeah, we've moved money for you. Or if we're dealing with a dishonest solicitor, you know, they won't even tell me then. It'll be after, you know, when I'm looking around to see where it's all gone. The TPMA solution is, like I said, slightly different. And that's where when we had that interaction with Jeff. It was to make sure that the product that we're developing was that, one, law firms understood what it meant for them and how they then explained the whole logistics behind it to, to their clients and what it actually meant in terms of protections as well. So, yeah, it's been, been good. Um, I yeah. think we've learned, learned a lot along the way from each yeah. other as well. I, I think the, the gen, there's a general principle there in relation to, to the, 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 the SRA are, are there to, 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 to engage with innovators and the providers of, of tech solutions we, we we can never endorse particular products but we're there to explain our requirements to explain our rules to explain how we do things so innovators can can you know develop solutions that 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 that, that solicitors can be confident that they can use and still be compliant with our rules and and, and i think that's you know that has been very much felt by by us um, in in this in these engagements. Um, by no means have you give it. You know the one of the things that that you often you are often asked as the SRA, I'm sure, to endorse people. But I think the main right. point is that a law firm, but you never will, and understandably so. But but the main point is that a law firm needs to look at all of these solutions they look into as part of the risk management and their own due diligence for their own practice. So if they choose to expose their clients to the use of a particular process or particular third party provider for whatever it may be, they need to be do the due care and con due care and, and consideration of what that product is. Um, one of the main aspects on the great thing about third party managed accounts for some citizens it removes the um the or the, the, the adherence or the need to adhere to the accounts rules to a certain extent. But what it doesn't do, and that's the same to any use of any third party solution, is remove the code of conduct obligations that a right. solicitor would have exactly. um, overarching either practice or as an individual. And so it's very important when when you know when we speak to people, we say yes, you, you no longer are required to uh, follow the uh, the um, uh, the client account rules as such because it's not client money um, but what you are you still need to make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to do and that's one of the one of the main things you're still responsible and other <coughs> duties in that respect so there's a shift of liability but not all of it but that you know that's and you know that that due diligence requires you to check that that company that you're dealing with is going to remain solvent that that company is going to be it's got the right security protocols in place um you know all of those matters that um, 
that you know are part of your your risk management. Yeah. That you do. We, we, we were talking about security, Jeff, earlier. I mean, from your perspective as an innovator, do, do, you, do, you, do you sincerely believe that standard uh, law firm and a freelancer can provide the same level of security? I, I think with the right tools, um, a freelancer can be as secure, if not more secure, than someone without a, a larger firm without those tools. Um, mm -hmm. it's the age old model between the top end of the firms that have all of the resources in the world to create security protocols and 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 have IT departments and etc., yet they still fall victim of data breaches um, because they've had loopholes or they have legacy systems. Whilst you can have a freelance solicitor who uses you know systems that are like guys or ours or any number of systems combined and be as resilient, if not more resilient, to attacks than um, a small or larger law firm. Um, because they've removed all of those external risks. The, the majority of the risks, security risks, are not necessarily in the systems, they're in the number of inefficient processes that exist within a firm. Yeah, that, that's actually kind of, I was trying to explain to someone yesterday that, you know, when they say, can, how secure is your system? Can you hack into the system? It's not, it's not a case of security in terms of uh, hacking. It's, a, it's the fact that someone gets an email which says, here's a link, please go ahead and pay this invoice. And sometimes that email comes on a Friday and they can't check it until the following Monday. So, you know, what and a traditional lawyer, you know, has to sort of uh, think about what's best to do and then and then go ahead and do it. But with a product like ShieldPay, you know, at least in my experience, um, ShieldPay is taking the extra steps of making sure that the payee is who they say they are, the payer is who they say they are, um, and, you know, sending SMSs and... and making it basically less risky for a solicitor to to send money around you know and it's something that i realized recently about about the legal profession is lawyers basically have two functions they're supposed to give you legal advice and then they're supposed to hold money on your behalf and remit it in certain instances and so you know third party managed accounts just give them the ability to to do that you know have very powerful um tools at their hands but uh, in a very secure and, and safe way that's what I like about the shield pay product and you know the third party managed account concept. It it, it 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 really makes me it really makes me feel hopeful that you know there there seem to be very successful uh, essentially guidance on the side of the SRA how innovators can actually work. I think that there is a common misperception that a lot of the regulatory uh, authorities, regardless of uh, which uh, particular industry vertical it is, are are completely uncooperative with innovators which is clearly not uh, the case um, and, and and the fact that and the fact that people are actually able to provide that clear guidance is it's really what makes products good and compliant and and what uh, allows people to essentially you know move forward with the way that they practice practice law um, I've got uh, I've got one question for you Jatinder, um, are clients of freelancers able to access the SRA's uh, compensation fund? Uh, I believe you may be muted. <laughs> Sorry. That's there all right. Um, I think that's a really, really important question because this was something that we that we were thinking about as we were developing the different models of how solicitors could practice and who is the compensation fund available to. Um, and it's like I said that you know it's always the the sort of the the worst case scenarios that we end up with when we're looking at the compensation fund because it is when clients have lost money. So it's about making sure okay if we've put a control on someone that they're not allowed to hold any client money then. What does that actually mean? Yeah, they're not allowed to hold any client money, but does it mean that they should still have access to the compensation fund? And I think this is where, you know, the lawyers in the room that are listening in will, will realize that, okay, yeah, there are certain circumstances that even if I'm not operating a client account as a freelancer, or even as a, you know, a, a, a solicitor in a traditional law firm setup, that I might still be um, able to access a client's money. So where I've been appointed as deputy or where I've been appointed as um, a trustee or where I've been appointed through a power of attorney that I will have access to Jatinder Loyal's personal HSBC account. And we, we've seen so many stories where that money has actually been dishonestly used. So it hasn't even reached the law firm's client account. It hasn't even reached, you know, Jeff's TPMA solution. It's still sitting in the, the client's personal bank account. But because, yeah, 
Jeff or Emma have got that power of attorney or they're, they're acting as deputy through court protection, they've got access to my personal bank account. So it's important to realise that, yeah, that where what we confirmed was that through the, the protections that if a solicitor was practising on their own, so this is where the, the rules, the compensation funds rules really set out in terms of who the protections apply to. So it's any solicitor that's practising on their own, um, doesn't have employees and they've engaged directly with the, the client as well. So you could have a situation that, you know, even a client of a freelancer doing unreserved work that was engaged directly with that individual, not through a service company, would have access to the compensation fund. And the same for the, the solicitor that was doing reserve work, their clients would have access to the compensation fund as well. It's really important protection. Um, because, yeah, there, there are many circumstances, like I so said, we can come up with so many different scenarios where people think, oh, I'm not holding client money, so why, you know, freelancers sometimes ask the question, why do I need to contribute to the compensation fund? It's because of those reasons that you still have access to a client's money. The client's money doesn't have to be, be sitting in the a client account or a TPMA for it to be misused. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Jatinder. Um, Jeff, can you tell us? I mean, you know, with, with any innovation, it's always working in progress. You know, there, there, there is no end to, to improvements. Um, you know, what are the improvements coming up for, for, for customers and, and how are they aligning with the, with the regulations that are introduced by the SRA? Um, that's a, a wonderful question because it tees me up perfectly. But uh, the, the, one of the, you know, I think there's a lot of discussion around what uh, the principle of assured, assured identity might be or um, KYC and AML and whether or not the Fifth Money Laundering Directive, whether or not people, regulated entities can actually start um, actually placing reliance and really relying on one another's uh, KYC and AML. That's something that we're very, very keen to be a part of. The solution to one of the um, elements that we undertake we will always do money laundering checks and kyc on every client and every every person that pays us will be paid but um what we what we will be extending is rather than what we now provide with a is verified or is not verified by shield pay we're looking to provide a lot more of the wealth of the data that we gather to make that decision and give that to our clients um, but that is a product development that will come um and one of our, I guess that'll be the, the standout one in due course, but it's um, it's a little way off yet. But um, that's the exciting one to come. Fantastic. So, without further ado, I'm going to put forward a few questions from our audience. I promise only the nice ones. <laughs> so, yeah. so um, we've got a question from Derek Coco. Could not a client better an undertaking? Who wish to take that question? Jay? It, it, um, I'm not sure I understand the, the undertake, yeah. uh, the question as such, because mm. um, the undertaking... Derek, normally, could you clarify, please? Um, the questions are normally, you know, undertakings are normally given on behalf of the client to you know somebody else in the the transactions to the other the other party in the transaction so it could be a solicitor or somebody else um and it's always you know nine times out of ten um all professional undertakings that i've seen will be given for the benefit of the client um so in conveyancing transactions we always see you know um i undertake to discharge mortgages on receipt of completion monies that you know that that's on behalf of the client that's selling the property that they want to make sure that there's nothing coming to them afterwards in terms of um, unpaid mortgages, but the person that's buying the house as well, they want to have title that's free of any charges that might have existed. Um, so I'm not sure how the client could. If it, if a client did think that they could fetter an undertaking that had been given by a, by a law firm, then there's questions around whether the solicitor was acting independently um, and more importantly, that you know, were they doing anything that could potentially take an unfair advantage of anybody else in the transaction as yeah. well? So, I think independence is really important, which is why it stayed as a, a professional principle um, in the new standards and regulations that solicitors always need to act independently. We, we do we do have a, cl a slight clarification here from Derek. Uh, what he meant is uh, in terms of the use of third party account needing universal approval. So. Well, I don't know. I, I, I'm probably well placed to, to kind of to, to butt in on that, but the, um, the the principle is that a third party managed account can either be a project account where multiple parties, all parties are involved, but generally speaking, they are used by one law firm. And so you're, the, the, 
the undertakings you wouldn't the, the undertakings that people will provide are only to the extent that um, I undertake to uh, to instruct um, the third party managed account provider to execute the payments, much like currently a solicitor's undertaking ought to contain wording that um, I will auth I will be instructing my bank to make the payment. And that is to the extent of their responsibility. Um, in, in the case of whether or not it requires the, uh, uh, the whether a, a client could over overstep that then that's absolutely in your in the in the process that you need to um you know need that's that's down to the law firm to figure out in their own practice and in their own process with 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 their clients um and, and, and I, we're very happy to take that um derek um, separately if you would like by all means I'll, I'll be more than happy to to connect you uh, after the webinar as well um one one over to you guy why do you feel a potential client would uh, use a freelancer rather than a traditional firm? That's a question from Linda Burke. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice question. And it's something I, I chat to freelancers about uh, quite a bit. Um, I think that, you know, traditionally law firms have, have obviously held some sort of advantage in terms of reputation. And, you know, if you go to a big firm, uh, you're going to get a certain level of service. Um, but all solicitors actually have a, a brand, and very often it's a brand that they build up over many years. Very often uh, solicitors come via a referral from uh, from someone who's used them in the past. Uh, like I alluded to earlier on, very often a solicitor gets a referral from another solicitor. I think the Clio um, survey that was done last year said that something in the range of 77% of, of everyone who finds their way to a solicitor actually comes through a referral, be it from a, a client or another lawyer, um, as opposed to sort of doing a Google search uh, as you would with many of the other professions. So I think that a lot of it uh, really does come down to, to your reputation, to the work you've done in the past. Um, and, and that's something that, uh, that is not the purview specifically of a law firm. It, it very often is uh, the case that the solicitor is the person who, who attracts the work. Uh, which is one of the reasons why partners get paid more money at big firms if they bring in more work. Um, and it also speaks to the way in which uh, solicitors who who have a good brand and who, you know, get out there and, and do good work and build networks uh, can really take advantage of, of those networks. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Guy. Um, I th we're over time now. Uh, Jatinder, Emma, Jeff, Guy, it's been an honor and a pleasure to spend this afternoon wow. with you. <laughs> Thanks so much thank for you. setting it thank up. You. Thank, thank you very I much for everyone that joined. The people that were listening. <laughs> and uh, I wish everyone a fantastic bank holiday. I'm sure you all have big plans for the coming weekend. Yeah. We Making do. homemade yeah. pizza. Stay yeah. safe. Thanks, anyway, just to everybody listening as well, can they? We just want to sort of plug that there is there is guidance on our website, and I think some of the questions that might have come through is again where people have. I'm not saying that you should you need to read our guidance first, but we have developed a whole range of guidance and it's really important to understand one of the, the key things to I think pick up on is the guidance that we publish or a page where we've said different ways of working and that sets out you know solicitors in traditional law firms to freelancers working on their own um, to solicitors working in-house to solicitors setting up their own companies and providing unreserved legal services so that I think people just need to start thinking about okay what resource of the SRA provided but yeah um, if people do want to ask yeah any questions of us I'm sure Emma and I will be happy to to speak to people and connect. of course we would, of course we um, would. yeah we're not doing face-to-face -face yeah. meetings so <laughs> I can attest to the fact that they answer their emails even on weekends yeah. <laughs> but don't get okay. used to that please thank yeah. you guys <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Right. Thanks, Thank everyone. you. Bye. 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 Bye.